Hi and welcome to the Rivers Church YouTube page. Thanks for taking the time to join us today, whether you're tuning in from near or far. If you'd like any information on our church, you can head to our website at www.rivers.church and find out all the information that you need. Well, for now, Pastor Andre will be sharing the word and it's actually based on one of the chapters of his brand new book titled Cultivating Divine Wisdom. So why don't we lean in today with open hearts as we hear the sharing of God's word together. I've been reading about a number of lifestyle social media influencers. Have you heard of the term? Lifestyle social media influencers. Because you've got entertainment social media influencers or sport uh, social media influencers. You know, people like Ronaldo, he's a sport influencer. People follow him. Um, he's got uh, 787 million followers, and people follow them just because of what they do in their sport. But then you get people who are lifestyle social media influencers. They, they tell you how to live. In fact, they shift people's mindsets, get them to think a certain way, get them to buy a certain way by their influence and their posts on social media. One of them is a lady called Zoe Zag. She's got nine million followers. Another one, Ju Julie uh, Saranana, 7.2 million followers. They post pictures of fashion and, and items that they wear and buy and where they eat and so on. Uh, there's a guy called Mark Rober. He's a tech influencer, 23.3 million followers. Becky G, she's a beauty influencer, lifestyle influencer. 34.8 million people will click on her and listen to her and respond to her, and they shift people's values and preferences and how they think and how they spend their money. Pretty powerful thing. This is the world we live in today. Some of you young people have grown up in this, and it's normal. And uh, they, they are called influencers, but I, I don't know if you realize it here. Maybe you don't think of leadership in the way that you should. Leadership is actually one thing. It's influence. And these people through posting food and clothing items and silly lipsticks and things and, and tech gadgets are actually leading people to a certain way of thinking and spending. And I think it's an important thing to realize that Christians are meant to be influencers. We are not meant to follow the world, we are meant to lead the world. See, leadership is not a position, it's not a title, it's influence. And sadly, across the world, including in our country, we keep putting people into positions and then they don't produce the goods and then we're surprised. Well, if you haven't got any ability, but you get a position, it doesn't make you a leader. Leadership is about influence. It's getting people to go in a certain direction and to accomplish certain goals. And so I want to speak to you today, and I've entitled the message, Taking the Lead. Taking the Lead. We must take the lead and not follow. And... Uh, there's a shortage of leadership in the world. If you read articles online, including the World Economic Forum, they say there's an 86% shortage of leadership in the world. People have got positions and titles, but there's no real leadership. And so the church is in a very valuable position where it can lead and influence people for good. Because contrary to the world, when we influence people, it's for their good and God's glory. When worldly people influence you, it's usually for profit and their advantage and your disadvantage. Isn't that true? So God wants to use his church and he wants us to take the lead even though we are imperfect and uh, don't just look at the weaknesses and the failings, look at the good that's come in your life. The blessing, the prosperity, the breakthroughs, the deliverance. People have been addicted and, and broken, grown up in dysfunctional homes and they end up being blessed by God and raised. Often when you become a Christian, your whole life goes up a level. But the world tries to tell you that it has more knowledge, it has more wisdom, and it has the way. No, it doesn't. It has a way. We have the way, the truth, and the life. And we must take the lead. <laughs> we remind you of Deuteronomy 28. The Lord promises that when we serve Him and follow Him, our lives get better, not worse. It says here in Deuteronomy 28 from verse 12, the Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your land. God promises, if you follow him, he'll bless you. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you'll always be at the top, never at the bottom. 
That's a promise of God. You might not be living it right now, but you need to hold on to it, and you need to follow God so that you can take the lead and be the head and not the tail. But somehow we keep getting influenced by the world. They seem to know more than us. They seem to be more broad-minded. They seem to be more inclusive. No, God has got no plan B. The church is plan A. And he wants to use his church, and he wants to use you and I with our weaknesses, even with our growth that we, we're in a state, you know, we're all in a place of growing. He wants to use us to take the lead. The Bible tells us that in Acts chapter 27, Paul was sent on a ship to Rome because he appealed to King Agrippa, and he was a Roman citizen. He was, he was falsely arrested and accused of, 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 of dissension, and he appealed to Caesar, so they sent him on a ship and he went to Rome. It was two ships, in fact. They switched ships at Alexandria. And uh, as he traveled on that ship, it went through a terrible storm. We'll read about it. And finally, the ship was shipwrecked. It was completely broken up by the waves. And the ship had, I think it's 276 people on the ship. So this is not a little boat. I don't want you to get them that they were in a little boat and it got really hectic and they were vomiting and then it sank and then they... No, no, this was a major cargo ship contracted to the Roman government for transporting prisoners. And Paul was put on there with Luke. Luke went as a companion. Aristarchus was one of the people who was also prisoner for the gospel. And there were a few other people. And 276 prisoners chained to Roman centurions uh, were sent across the sea in the storm. And on this journey, Paul is a prisoner and he's the lowest ranked person on the ship. You've got centurions, you've got captains, you've got pilots, you've got sailors. And then you've got prisoners. Paul's right at the bottom, according to title and position. Yet during the whole journey, and the fact that all of them made it onto the beach, all 276 were actually saved, was due to Paul taking the lead. And I want you to see what he said and did so that you can do the same thing because we're living through stormy times. We're living where we're being battered. We're being influenced and People are shipwrecking their lives, shipwrecking their homes and their marriages, and we have to stop being battered. We have to stand up. Even though we don't have position or title, or we're not regarded as Christians, every Christian is an influencer, and we just say, I'm going to take the lead. Can you say amen? So I'm going to read different portions from here, and we're going to look at eight qualities of people who take the lead. But before we get there, John Waxwell says this, and I want you to see this in not just in context of business leadership or church leadership, but to see it as, as a Christian. He says this, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Now surely, if you took the word leader out, just leave it on the screen, a Christian is one who knows the way, goes the way and? See, many of us know the way and go the way, but we don't show anyone the way. It's time for us to take the lead and to step up and to say, hey, this is what God says. This is the way to go. And for us to build the kingdom so that people come out of the world. We can't change the world. It's decaying and it will be judged. We've got to call people into the kingdom. Instead of trying to merge the kingdom and the world, we've got to speak up and get people to come out of the shipwreck storm into the kingdom. Are you with me? And so leadership wins people over. Paul here becomes a leader. He has no rights, no position, but he becomes an influencer. And we pick it up in Acts 27. It says, before very long, they, this is on the second ship now, they're sailing to Rome. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship, not the boat, the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. I think some people's lives are like this. They just can't make headway, and they feel battered. And it says, as we passed to the lee of a small island called Corda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. How many of you can see this is a pretty big crisis they're facing? They're being battered, and the boat is threatening to break up, and they're trying to hold it together. Then it says, because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis, they lowered a sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. When you drop an anchor, it kind of drags, and so it keeps the boat pointed in the right way. Otherwise, it turns sideways, and it can capsize. Uh, he, he goes on to say, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day, they began to throw the cargo overboard. This is a commercial ship. 
but they, they, were, they wanted to make it lighter. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, the storm continued raging. We finally gave all, up all hope of being saved. Can you see this is a dire situation? This is not some little trip, even like with Jesus across the lake. Lord, we're going to die. No, this is a ship. This is like a cruise liner. And this is a serious situation. And it speaks to me of the times we're living in. We are being battered. And some people have given up all hope. But Paul becomes a leader in the midst of all this and he takes the lead. And I want to encourage you to take the lead too. Eight qualities of people who take the lead. Are you with me? Number one, the first thing we see that Paul did is, and, and, and we need to be like this if we want to take the lead in our culture, is they are good on relationships. People who take the lead are good on relationships. Indira Gandhi, who was the third prime minister of India, she said, I suppose leadership at one time meant muscles, in other words, force, but today it means getting along with people. So you can force people, you can bully people, you can coerce people, but that's not true leadership. Leadership is influence. Leadership is getting along with people. Leadership is winning people. And often when people disagree with us, we withdraw from them. But we actually need to engage them and build bridges with them. Then when we share the gospel with them, they'll be more open. Paul did that on the ship. You saw, how do you know? Well, if you read the whole passage, which we haven't got time to do, but we're gonna read portions of it, we can see that it took just one day and Paul already has influence on the ship because he built relationships. Acts 27 verse three, it says the next day, they were, on, they were on, just on the boat for one day. The next day we landed at Sidon and Julius, he was a centurion in the imperial regiment, in kindness to Paul allowed him to go to his friends so that they might provide for his needs. Do you know that if a centurion let a prisoner escape, that centurion's life would be forfeited for that of the prisoner? Yet Julius says to him, you can go to your friends in Sidon, you can hang out, you can pray, you can eat with him because I know you'll come back because he had built a relationship with Paul. In fact, at the end, Paul says that uh, they all need to stay on the ship, otherwise they won't be saved. And because uh, men started jumping overboard out of fear when they, when they hit this uh, uh, reef just off Malta, um, the centurion, out of love for Paul, told them, no, don't kill the prisoners because he had built such a good relationship with Paul. I believe we need to build relationships with people, then they will listen and take our lead. When you go to Bryars, don't fight with people. <laughs> build a bridge to them, take an interest in them, and then maybe you'll have an opportunity to share. You might have not the authority or the position, but God will use you, but you first got to build a bridge. And many people came to Christ because Paul was able to influence them and build relationships with them. Brian Tracy, who is a business leader, said the three C's of leadership are consideration, caring, and courtesy. Be polite to everyone. As a Christian, we should seek to build relationships and not to compromise our values, but how will we reach people and lead people if we don't relate to people? Can you say amen? Number two, second thing in taking the lead, this is what Paul did, is they step up, not step away in a crisis. They step up, not step away. Paul didn't jump overboard when they were in the storm and take care of himself. He stayed on board and offered help and advice. He stepped up to add value. And South Africa is in a crisis. If we all immigrate, who will be left behind to build the nation? Stop bringing South Africa down. Step up, don't step away. The world pretends to offer you peace and success and an ideal life. No, it's only in the kingdom you will experience that. And God wants to use us. Leadership is tested in times of crisis. And the church is being tested as to how she will respond. Will she huddle in a holy huddle and isolate herself? Or will she step up and take the lead? Paul stepped up. He didn't step away. And that's what leaders do. The third thing Paul did, and we need to do the same, and I'll, we'll read the text a moment where he did this, is they speak even when people don't listen. See, we think the world doesn't want to listen to us, so we don't speak. No, we just speak despite the fact that they don't listen. Because God can take what we've said and later on impress it upon them. Am I making sense? See, it's very important for us that we realize we've got an obligation to speak God's word 
and to speak advice to the world and to tell them what God has said and what God wants to do in them and through them and how God wants to bless them and save them and lift their lives. And the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter three that if we don't warn people and speak to them, God will hold us accountable. He says, if you see people going, you know, shipwrecking their lives and they're lost and you don't speak to them, I'll, I'll hold you accountable for their blood. But if you've spoken to them and offered advice and help, even if they don't listen, I won't hold it to your charge. Now, the Bible tells us here in Acts 27, they're on the journey, watch this, much time had been lost and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. That's around the 24th, 25th of September. So this could have been in the beginning of October, a very bad time to be on the Mediterranean as they go into autumn and the seas change and it becomes a completely different dynamic. And says, so Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. Well, clearly, Paul, who are you? Some religious fanatic, and you're telling us to sail this ship? We're used to this. We, this is our career. This is what we do for a living. You're a nutter. And they don't listen to him, but he speaks up nonetheless. Are you with me? And sometimes the world has knowledge, but they don't have the wisdom of God. And because of their profit, maybe, their contract with the Roman government, they don't listen to him. And so they shrug him off, but he still speaks up because he, he has some wisdom from God. Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that he, he was shipwrecked three times. He spent a day and a night in open water. He's got something to say about what he's been through. And Paul speaks up because he knows that God has given him a responsibility to be an influencer, even though he doesn't have position or title. Number four, the fourth thing Paul did, and we'll build a picture as we go along, is he, and we need to do this, they inspire people by their example. If we're gonna take the lead, we need to inspire people by example. People are watching how we live, they're watching how we react to crises. Are we adding to the negativity? Acts 27 verse 33, it says, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you have been in constant suspense and have gone without food. Listen, it's one thing when passengers are, are afraid on a ship, it's another thing when the crew don't eat. You know you're in trouble. And it says you haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. You can't have weak people and weak sailors trying to sail a ship. He says, not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. He's like eating by himself. I love verse 36. They were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. It's like, oh, well. He's eating, let's eat. It's amazing how you can trigger people and influence. Don't go to a briar and join in the conversation of how many potholes we have and how bad South Africa is and how this political party and that political party and this thing and that thing and we all pull each other into a hole and then we all eat together and we commiserate and we go home more negative than we came. I think we need to maybe set an example, speak differently, live people's lives. We've all... We've all been guilty of this, it's so easy. Especially if you get news sent to you on your phone. First thing in the morning, tells you what's going on. So before your soul can soar, no, 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 I have to take the lead. Then I still need to know what's going on in my country. But I've got to let God lead me. Let his word lead me. Let his voice speak to me. And we've got to be people who lead by example. The fifth thing that Paul did, and we need to do as well if we're going to take the lead, is they know whose they are and who they serve. See, Paul didn't panic and jump overboard and try and save himself. He knew who he belonged to the Lord. He knew who he was serving. He knew he was serving God's purposes. Can I say this to you today? If you're alive, you're serving God's purpose. He's got a plan for your life. And it's not just to bless you and prosper you and so you can get another car and a nice house and travel and wear nice clothes. Your life is much more important to God than that. He wants to use you, that he might display his glory, that he might use you to lead and reach other people. And so let's enjoy all the blessings of the Lord and our, as our lives go up, but we've got a job to do. We've got a responsibility. And Paul here is facing a massive challenge but he trusts that there's a sense that God is on his side and that God is taking him to Rome for a divine purpose. Acts 27, let's pick it up again. He says to them, but now I urge you to keep up your courage 
because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. So Paul is not just saying, everything's gonna be fine. He's not a motivational speaker. Just believe, 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 and keep your eyes on the positive, not the negative. No, he's saying, hey, there's trouble cometh, but in the midst of it, God's got his hand on us. And he says, a ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, of the God, sorry, to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all, you, all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God, watch this, that it will happen just as he told me. You know what God's told us in his word? We need to believe that it will happen as he has said. Yeah, Paul had a word from God, but we've got the word of God. And it says, nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Paul had strong convictions that he belonged to the Lord and that God would take care of him, even though he would go through trouble. The ship would be shipwrecked. There would be loss of the ship, but the lives of people would be saved because he knew who he belonged to and who he was serving. Do you know that you belong to the Lord? You don't just attend a church and get some input. You are hid with Christ in God. You are a believer living in another kingdom. God is working in you and through you for his eternal purpose for to take you to heaven. I want to say this to you, your calling and God's promises to you will be tested. Even when God gives you big promises from the word, like a word, like he, I know God's told me he's got someone for me to marry. I know God's going to bless me with a business. Even that will be tested because Joseph got two, uh, two lots of dreams where he was told that his brothers would bow down to him. But Psalm 105 tells us that, that he ended up in prison and the word of the Lord was tested in his life. You must take the lead. Joseph had to take the lead despite being tested. Number six, here's a sixth thing that Paul did and we need to do the same. They never compromise on absolutes. You see, Paul was told by God that everyone needed to stay on the ship and that the ship would be shipwrecked but no lives would be lost. And the Lord said, if you, if you want them to be saved, no one must, must jump overboard. So Paul did not then change God's instructions. He didn't tweak it, he stuck to it. You see, here's, here's, a, here's a key thing. When it comes to, to things like marriage, you better compromise. In fact, this is the word of the Lord to some of you. <laughs> Thou shalt not be stubborn and pig-headed. Thou shalt listen and make compromises, or thy marriage is over. <laughs> see, on style, taste, and preference, compromise creates unity. But on principle, there's no compromise. So when God told Paul, all these people must stay on the boat or you won't be saved, he didn't say, well, you know, the Lord said this, but I think we can adjust it. No, no, those who lead can't have compromises. So compromise is good in marriages and in certain kinds of relationships, but it's not good when it comes to God's principles. You can't tweak God's word. Oh, the Lord said that about marriage, but we know that when you get older, that doesn't work and... You know, yeah, you mustn't, you know, there mustn't be sexual immorality, but when you get to 40, I mean, what do you do? No, 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 you can't compromise. If you're gonna lead, you must know exactly what you believe and you must stick to it. Let me take you back to the word before you write me an email, Acts 27. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurion, this is Paul taking the lead again. He said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that hold the lifeboat and let it drift away. You see, you've got to stick to what God said, otherwise you won't be saved. Let me bring this into, the, you know, the ship is a picture sometimes of the church. People say, I, 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 like, I love the Lord, but I don't like the church. No, no, you need to be part of the ship if you want to be saved. You can't believe in Jesus and have your own version, you need to stay on the ship. But I don't like the ship, it's full of animals. That's God's design. It's like the ark, it must have been stinky. All, these, all the poop and all the crowing and the barking and the howling was God's vehicle of salvation. And unless you stayed on it, you were judged. So God's vehicle for the church looks like a whole lot of weird people put together. We're like animals sometimes. But it's, you need to stay with it. You can't compromise because it's God's plan A. I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> Number seven. This is what Paul did, and we need to do the same if you're going to take the lead, is they're not ashamed of the church or the gospel. 
See, if you're ashamed of the church, you'll never take the lead. You won't want people to know you're a Christian. Paul wasn't ashamed of being a believer, yet he took the lead. And you can't be ashamed. He, he says this in Romans 1, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. The gospel is powerful. The gospel changes lives. It builds families, unites marriages, grows kids up that aren't dysfunctional. This thing we hold forth is the answer. It is the salvation in the midst of storms. Take the lead. But you'll never take the lead if you're like, oh, you know, excuse me, but I, I just want to mention what the Bible says. No, you speak up. Amen? Let me come to a close. Number eight. The kind of people that take the lead, this is what they do. Like the Apostle Paul, they embrace divine wisdom, not the trends of the times. Are you all still with me? See, Paul had divine wisdom. That's why he could lead, because he wasn't offering knowledge. He was offering wisdom. There's a big difference. People go to universities to get educated, and it's all good and well. But it, that, learns, that teaches you how to do something, not how to live life. Wisdom does not teach you a skill. It teaches you how to live your life in entirety. And that's what the church does for you. That's what the gospel does for you. I've just released a book called Embracing Divine Wisdom from a series that I just, uh, that I finished, sorry, and just managed to finally write it. And in this book, I speak about the three kinds of wisdom. We all live on the planet Earth, which is the middle one. And we can either be influenced from under the earth, like from the pit of hell, from with demonic wisdom. That's where all the trouble comes from. Or we can trust God for divine wisdom. When you trust God for divine wisdom, your life goes up. When you trust God, when you listen to demonic wisdom, your life goes down. And, uh, and Paul didn't just have knowledge or experience, he had divine wisdom. And if you're gonna take the lead, you need to know the wisdom of God. You need to be walking with the Lord in the Holy Spirit, studying the word of God, because the world's wisdom doesn't work, but God's wisdom brings good outcomes. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul says, thanks be to God, it always leads us in triumph. We will overcome, we will be victorious when we follow God's wisdom, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We need to build relationships, step up, not step away. We need to be people who speak up even when people don't listen. We need to set an example. We need to not be ashamed of the gospel, and we need to hold on to divine wisdom, and we need to take the lead in our country, because more than ever, the church is needed to take its place. Every believer is a leader.